everyone. I think it's time to get started. Uh, my name is Mary Houston, and I want to welcome you to our November Spaminar. It's our monthly gathering uh, for live theater prop professionals and anyone interested in stage props. Again, my name is Mary, and I am the uh, Assistant Professor of Design and Technology at the University of Northern Colorado, as well as uh, the Prop Shop Supervisor within our theater department. Just some information about SPAM. Um, SPAM was formed in 1994 to create a fellowship among prop professionals to address issues of common importance and to create parity with other production areas. We are an association of professional prop educators and managers from non-for-profit producing organizations with an international communication and support network that shares resources, information, solutions, and techniques, as well as safety information, continuing education, and stock. We promote the highest professional standards among prop artisans and craftspeople and the field of props to potential props professionals while working to establish educational standards for the training of prop artisans. We now have over 150 active members reaching from Hawaii to Ireland and Canada to Florida. As with previous seminars, we're requesting pay what you can donations to help support this programming and our annual grants for early career prop professionals. If you can afford to donate, the link will be in the chat during the session, and we truly appreciate any help you can give. We have enabled live transcriptions for this webinar. If you'd like to use them, click on the live transcript button at the bottom and then select show subtitle. Alternately, you can click full uh, view full transcript to see in the, it in the meeting side panel. For tonight's webinar, we have Larry Hyman, who will be talking about stage, decor stage decoration and dressing and the challenges it presents. He'll touch on how it's an extension of the narrative created by the director and set designer, and we'll discuss issues and concerns that occur when we're painting the details of the set from an artistic and storytelling perspective. Larry is an assistant professor in properties design and fabrication and a lecturer in the design program in the Oklahoma City University School of Theater. In addition to teaching, Larry has worked in the props department at the La Jolla Playhouse, the Goodman Theater, the Huntington Theater, and the Utah Shakespearean Festival. And as a freelance set decorator, set dresser, and greensman on multiple feature films, including Rushmore, Hope Floats, Varsity Blues, and Miss Congeniality. His work has been seen in the art departments of trade shows for Mercedes-Benz USA and Toyota. He received his MFA specifically in properties design from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign after completing a BFA in design and technical production at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater. Larry recently contrib contributed a chapter to the book Mad Men in Politics, Nostalgia and the Remaking of Modern America. He is the co-founder of Oklahoma City Harvest, a nonprofit organization that builds and plants community gardens in urban schoolyards. When he's not working, he can be found designing and building furniture, cooking and spending time with his wife and their three children. I'll be your moderator and host for the evening. So if you have questions, please post them in the chat and I'll pose them to Larry during the Q&A following his presentation. Be sure to stay to the end to hear about our upcoming Spaminars and other ways you can interact with and learn from our membership. And with that, let's get started. Hi, Larry, you wanna take it over? Sure, thanks, Mary. Thanks for, uh, thanks for that fantastic introduction, always great. And it's always great to see everybody, see all of my friends and see all the new, new faces and names on the screen. So welcome everybody, thanks for coming. Um, as Mary mentioned, I have some experience and um, in, in props and set decoration. And so um, I just, it, this is, a, this is a, a, a subject that's sort of near and dear to my heart. And it's one of those things where I don't feel like anybody ever teaches how to do this or discusses how it's done. It's just one of those things that kind of happens. I jokingly say uh, it's one of those things that sort of happens as we're uh, wandering around in the dark and trying to avoid walking into ladders on stage during um, the week before tech. Um, and so I just wanna talk a little bit about set decoration because it is sort of a forgotten narrative. And one of the things that I, I as, as Mary mentioned, I started out in theater and then uh, I, I sort of um, morphed and did some film work. And then I came back to theater. And one of the things that the film experience kind of gave me is that 
um, that the, the departments are separated, that props is one department and set dressing and decoration is another. And um, I've tried to kind of coalesce that into a, into a single department again in, my, in the program where I'm working, Oklahoma City University. Um, but it's also something where I just try and teach the thought process because sometimes we don't always think about why we're doing things because we're in such a hurry to get them done. So I wanna go ahead and share my screen. And uh, this is always entertaining. Let me just do this. I'm gonna share that screen and start a slideshow. All right. So um, so let, let's just get started. Um, the first question that I always ask is why do we, why do we dress sets? And I, I put in parentheses here, wrong, wrong, wrong answers only. Um, to fill all that counter space on the kitchen set that we've just built for Crimes of the Heart, right? To, to, to fill space on an otherwise, that's otherwise left empty. To appease a designer, um, to make a, lo a room look more real. That's partially, you know, that's, that's not 100% incorrect. To give the actor something with which to interact while on set, that's a joke. Usually they, that's the first thing, you put a refrigerator on the set and the first thing that happens is actors walk up during their first stop at a tech rehearsal and open the refrigerator to see what you've put inside. Um, to create clutter. Uh, that's that's actually a, a that's a piece of feedback from a, from a former set design student of mine when we were talking about dressing um, their set for one of our shows and and the response was uh, well the set is so beautiful why would I want to clutter it with stuff and uh, I just I smiled and you know said oh bless your heart and uh, and went on um, to, to occupy time on a dark stage while lighting is focusing. So this sort of, I, I put this up just to kind of as a, as a bit of a joke, but this does, this highlights one particular thing. And that is we often leave set dressing until the last minute. It's usually the last thing we do after we've gotten all the real props for the show. And I'm putting real props in parentheses there. Um, and so uh, I want to kind of, I, I try to do a bit of a culture shift with my students and, and at least have them think about on sets that, are, that, that need dressing. And let's be honest, not every set needs dressing, but on sets that do need dressing, um, I try to encourage um, people to think about it as they're searching, as they're shopping, as they're visiting their favorite you know, consignment galleries or antique stores or whatever, just to look for one thing and just to set aside a few bucks in each of your budgets to buy a few things um, so that you're not just going over and harvesting the same things out of prop storage every time you do it, every time you dress a set. Try and make it a unique experience. So seriously though, why, why do we dress sets? Um, we dress sets to help the audience learn who the characters are um, we dress sets to establish when and where the story takes place. Um, we dress sets to give uh, details not evident in the text, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, to answer questions about a character's past, to tell the audience a secret. Um, Jim Guy isn't here tonight, I don't think, but he would tell you it's also to maybe to possibly tell the audience a joke um, and to create the reality in which the characters exist. And, and I have to say my first experience with recognizing that this was even a thing was when I was a senior in high school and I was, I was visiting colleges and I was invited to, um, go, to the, go to the University of Wisconsin Whitewater for their, their um, warm up day for, for, the, for potential theater majors. And the show that they had mounted at the time was um, Sherlock Holmes. And um, it was designed by the late, great Gene Wilson, who was the set designer and technical director there right up until I arrived. He retired the year before I got there. But so I saw one of his last shows. And we were, of course, invited to get up on stage and wander around and have a look. And um, one of the things that I noticed was, I mean, there, there was just an immense amount of stuff in Holmes's apartment, just everywhere. There were pipes, not just one pipe. There were multiple pipes with a cleaning knife and with bags of, of, of tobacco, like somebody who smokes a pipe would do. You know, you buy a new pipe, you don't throw away the old pipe, you keep the old pipe. And you buy new tobacco, you put that with, your, with the rest of your tobacco. And so there was this, the thing that, that sort of struck me was there was this accumulation of stuff as though somebody was, you know, somebody were living there. 
And the one thing that struck me was um, on the mantle, he had stacks of mail and they were these beautifully aged and, and curated, you know, historically, historically period looking um, um, uh, bundles of letters. And there was a letter opener and, and it was really neat. There was a bundle of, of letters and there was a letter opener stuck through them. So it was standing up on the mantelpiece. And there was a pen knife on the top of the letter opener. And there was one letter that had been singled out and stuck to the pen knife. And I was standing and looking at it and Jean Wilson came over to me and said, what do you, something catch your eye? And I said, yeah, that. And I pointed to it and he said, what about it? And I said, I just, it's such an interesting decision to make. And he shrugged and said, it just seems like something Holmes would do. And it was like, I mean, it was like the, you know, the sound of glass shattering in my head. I suddenly realized that you can think about stuff that isn't written down in the script and stuff that isn't said by the characters and use that to sort of tell the audience a little bit about who, whose house they're visiting. Um, so let me just jump to the next one. The, the, the thing that, the thing that for lack of a better, better idea, um, in, you know, set decoration occurs, as, as I've mentioned, mostly in film and television as a separate entity. And the thing that I've noticed is um, a lot of designers, and honestly, a lot of people in our profession love design magazines. And, and another story about that is um, I had friends in Houston, this is going back 20 years, who were among the first people to build a house using um, shipping containers. And they did this modular home out of shipping containers. And it was very sort of forward thinking and very cool and Dwell magazine. And I don't know if you've ever seen Dwell, but Dwell is like hip with inches, within inches of its life. It is so tragically cool. But they came to shoot the house. And it was really funny because our friends told us that they arrived uh, two days early because they emptied all of the homeowner's belongings out of the house and then redressed the house with their stuff, with, with new stuff, and then photographed it for the magazine. And, and it's one of those things, I have a friend who, uh, who was an art director for Architectural Digest. And one of the things that she said is, the most unnatural spaces you'll ever see are the spaces inside design magazines. They have been swept clean of everything that shows evidence of a human being living there and replaced with very gorgeous, very trendy, very cool furniture, but it has nothing to do with actually living in the space. Um, television shows are a little bit better, but really product placement and camera angles determine what's seen on any given TV show set. Um, so the job of the decorator or dresser is to curate storytelling objects and make suggestions as to the reality of the characters that they're that are being portrayed. And you see what's interesting, I'm going to television now, but I'm gonna come back to it in a minute. One of the things that is interesting is you see, if you watch TV shows from the very, very beginning through you know multiple seasons, you'll see the set decoration evolve as we learn things about the characters. And so since, since theater is always isolated to, or almost always isolated to a few hours in an evening, we kind of have to pack a lot of stuff, a lot of information into these things. And, and we do need to avoid clutter, but um, the first thing that I try and get people to stop thinking is to stop thinking about um, decoration as clutter. If you look at the bookshelves behind me, um, you see that there are some books that are standing upright, some books that are laying on their side, some books that are leaning. Some of that is art direction. I'll admit it. I, I work in this room regularly, and so I like to make sure that my backing looks like a good room. But some of that is just because of the way I use the room. It's just because of the way I use my bookshelves. And stuff gets crammed into the nooks and crannies and the openings. And that's not something that happens instantly. It's something that developed over time. But that very much kind of defined that and the, and the, and the sweet denim chair behind me sort of defines a little bit about what I like in my surroundings. One of the other things that you'll notice about me right now is that the room has no overhead lighting. Everything is done with ambient light. And that too is to create a specific way of looking at things. And so one of the things that we frequently forget about with, scener with scenic design and with set decoration is we forget about light sources on stage. And it's one of the things that I try and come back to. 
and and sort of paint in as as we said at the beginning. I keep hitting advance and it's not advancing. Look at that. Seriously, what kind of guy is Scrooge? So this is this is a, hey, that's a segue. Um, <laughs> But this is a little bit about that character analysis, that script analysis that I was talking about. Because frequently, I mean, you know, with a show of hands, don't really raise your hand, but I'll just say, I have worked on one, two, three, four, four different productions of A Christmas Carol. Um, and, and one of them is the is the 40 something year old production that's been going on at the Goodman Theater that is, you know, gorgeous and, and is propped and decorated by the one and only Alice McGuire. One of them is the one at the Huntington Theater. Um, one and then two are at theaters that I'm not even going to name. But um, but one of the things that I noticed is that for some reason, depending on whose adaptation you do, everybody has decided that Scrooge has nothing. Right. We've they've, there's this been there's been this sort of this sort of um, conventional wisdom opinion that Scrooge is a miser and therefore he has nothing. And I kind of question that a little bit because I think you got to dig a little bit and realize, one, he hasn't always been a miser. That's the whole point of the show. The ghosts take him and show him his past life and, you know, dancing with the Fezziwigs and hanging out with Belle and, you know, whatever else Scrooge does in the show. Um, but we visit him in his bedroom and it inevitably has a bed. Occasionally it will have a portrait of Jacob Marley, which seems a little weird, but okay. And that's it. Why is his bedroom always empty, but he owns bed curtains? Why is his bedroom always empty, but he owns a super expensive Victorian style four poster bed that he can hide in to get away from the ghosts? If we wanted to to story tell about Scrooge, what could we um, give him? Here's a typo, first of many, I'm sure. What could we give him that might hint at the rest of the action? And so I experimented with this at a couple of different productions and on a few of them, I got shut down and told I was out of my mind. And on a few um, people said, okay, um, so, you know, uh, uh, there are there are things that you can include. I, I know that in the Goodman's production, there was a mantle um, and it was when the haunting was first beginning, it was actually a pretty beautiful little effect. There was a mantle and a book that opened, began opening and closing and opening and closing and pages began fluttering with the arrival of Marley. So that's number one. If we're going to build some stuff in, maybe there's some stuff that is that that has a double life being sort of this entertaining set dressing. But the other thing is, what if Scrooge, and I threw this out at a meeting and I didn't get shot down. What if Scrooge is a hoarder? Like what if Scrooge is a crazy miser, but he's keeping all of this stuff to himself? Because that's the thing is, he has all this money, but he doesn't spend any of it. That's the whole point. And so what if in his bedroom, there were there was a chair or two and stuffed behind the chair, there was an old painting of maybe himself and Belle when they were younger that's covered in dust and cobwebs and he's forgotten about. What if there are stacks of those ledgers that he uses at work? What if he takes them home with them when he's done and he keeps them in his bedroom because they're his friends, they're his ledgers? What if in his bed, there's a ledger, you know, like building stuff into the set so that Scrooge looks a little bit more three-dimensional than he's portrayed because he is a three-dimensional character. And I, oh my goodness, if you put a good, good actor into the role, it's amazing. Um, I know those, you know, as a side note, um, any, any of my West Wing friends out there, um, Bradley Whitford is playing Scrooge in what is supposedly a fantastic touring production of A Christmas Carol. So the reason we're told not to, that this can't happen is because somebody somewhere made a decision that Scrooge has nothing, that he doesn't have anything that he doesn't need and that the bedroom has to be empty and it's cold and it's lonely and why would anybody care? Somebody made that decision. The other reason that we frequently don't see Scrooge's bedroom decorated is because um, unit sets, you know, a lot of times he rolls on in the bed and we don't have a lot of place to store other things because the bed comes on, the bed rolls off, stores someplace else. And then they do some magical flight over the city or whatever. And, and so there are the constraints of time and space. But 
just as a as an idea, I want to throw out there that maybe the conventional adaptations of characters who we frequently see are just the ideas of people who didn't know any better or didn't think any better or didn't have a set decorator around. So just something to think about. If you want, like one, one, of, the, uh, one, of, one of the little activities that I say is, if you have questions or comments, you know, please don't criticize. But if, I mean, I guess you can criticize if you want. But if you have questions or com comments that you want to throw into the chat, um, certainly do that. And if you have ideas for stuff that maybe you could put in Scrooge's bedroom that would make sense, that would make it just one thing, just one thing that we could add, that might be an entertaining thing to look at at the end. Oh, that's that's the final thing is um, uh, maybe he's hiding things. Maybe he's pilfered stuff. Maybe he's, you know, like like the miser sitting, in, you know, in, in the Moliere piece, sitting in his, you know, gigantic vault full of stuff at the end. Maybe his bedroom is where he hides stuff and he goes and he enjoys his things, but he doesn't let anybody else see it. I don't really know. And there may be a good reason for not doing it, but. The one argument that was given to me is Victorian bedrooms didn't have anything. And it's like, you know, I teach a class called period styles and decor, and I really appreciate it when people don't tell me what Victorians, which is not really a thing, would or would not have had. Um, one, of, one of the little, one of the little ep excerpts that I, I throw into my um, period styles and decor is that the Victorian era was made up of a series of different periods. Um, you know, there were, I mean, you've got, you've got Neo-Gothic and you've got Second Empire and you've got Queen Anne, um, all different style structures, Italian eight, all different style structures and interiors. But one of the things that's sort of standard is that in interiors, in Victorian rooms, they did like stuff. They liked carpeting, they liked wall treatment, they liked those hangy, downy, gaslight chandeliers. They liked big giant beds. They liked wardrobe cabinets and chairs. And so to say that Scrooge lives in such a way that he wouldn't have any of this in his bedroom, come on, a guy's gotta have a place to sit down, right? So that's just one of my illustrations of that idea. So what are our limitations? Frequently, um, you know, when we're doing this, uh, when, when, we're, when we're working on this, we're limited by what we can put on the set because there's only a finite number of surfaces. And so one of the things that I recommend to decorators early, or dressers early on is go in, see the objects being built, make notes, and as it's being installed in the theater, wander around and just get a sense of where things are and what they're, what they're doing. You know, there, there's that standard when we're talking about like kitchens, it sounds so stupid, but when you're talking about interior design, there's that magic triangle, right? In the kitchen, the sink, the stove and the refrigerator. And it's not usually some area where you can prep things. And I know it sounds silly, but maybe thinking about kitchens on sets that way would help the deck, the, the, the prop person dress that set. Um, the example, one of the examples that I give, and I'll talk about it in a minute, but one of the examples that I give is the set for a raisin in the sun where, um, you know, the mother in that, in that show has basically established a place for herself in the kitchen. And the idea that the counters are bare or empty because she keeps a clean house really kind of doesn't, doesn't wash with me. Hang on. Um, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing more than one thing. I need to. I need to stop and focus. Um, the other thing that 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 is important, though, is um, scenic mobility. I'm looking at my notes right now because I had some stuff written down that I wanted to make sure I didn't forget. Um, and so, um, scenic mobility is a huge um, a huge feature because, obviously, as I mentioned, if everything on Scrooge's set rolls or dismantles and turns into something else that you may be limited in how you can decorate it. But, but I will say, you know, um, it, it's, it's sometimes important to, um, to kind of go in and scope it out, get an idea, and then focus on how much time you have, how much time are you going to have to do this? And this is one of the things that, um, 
I, I think is really important where we need to advocate for ourselves because we've 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 entered into there are plenty of theaters where we sort of have this antiquated mode where props comes in and dresses the set whenever anybody isn't anybody else isn't on stage. You know, if sound needs to be in the theater and have quiet time, or if lighting needs to be in the theater and have light, you know, dark time, they sort of supersede everything else. And so it started out as a joke and it's turned into a real thing here. But at Oklahoma City University, I refer to it jokingly as pots and pans time, but we schedule in time for the props department to be on stage under light, dressing the set, not feeling our way around, not with flashlights sticking out of our mouths. Because I got to tell you, there's nothing worse than hanging paintings on a set in the dark with a flashlight sticking out of your mouth when you're on the second level of a two level set. So making sure that whoever is the power that be, whether it's the production manager or the technical director or somebody, making sure that you carve out a few hours when we're not, it's not dark and it's not quiet and we can run a drill and we can run it and we can use a hammer. And it's not, you know, at three o'clock in the morning. Oh, you can get on stage for your prop time at three o'clock in the morning. It's not an answer. Um, so space, scenic mobility, time, Frequently, we're limited by budget. And what I will say to that is, you know, I, I mean, if you if you need to go to storage and harvest stuff, go to storage and harvest stuff. But if you can set aside just a teeny tiny amount for just incidental stuff, just a set of period canisters that would go in the kitchen in Ruth Younger's kitchen in A Raisin in the Sun, I think it makes a huge difference. Um, so, but budget is always, you know, we're always up against the wall with that. Um, Stock, if we're limited, you know, I, I, I've worked at a couple of theaters that had zero stock because for whatever reason, they just thought it was a good idea to throw everything away and, you know, or they had no storage or they were constantly moving storage. I worked at one theater where the storage was in a warehouse that was owned by one of the board of trustees and uh, they were a real estate person and the warehouse was this dilapidated old building and the roof leaked. And so props was stored. We had gone in, they had gone in and actually mapped out spots on the floor where leaking didn't happen and, and the props could be safely stored. But I mean, talk about not wanting to put a lot of stuff into stock. You know, any, if, if, a, if a heavy rainstorm can destroy your entire prop stock, you know, you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. And of course, there's also the feature of time. Time is always the thing that we need to be focusing on. One of the things that I recommend, and I'll make a recommendation later, but one of the things that I recommend is begin gathering things and setting them somewhere, the front row of the theater, um, someplace where you would normally have a prop table backstage, um, you know, if you have shelving units in your prop shop, but start setting aside stuff that isn't props, but is set dressing. Um, where to start, you know, that's always the challenge. Um, so the first is the discuss is always discussions with uh, directors, designers, and even actors. And I always, um, I, I always try to be as open to suggestions and change as possible. And I try to approach everything with a certain level of wit. I, I try to I try to approach things with a little bit of humor because I found that if I approach things, approach a director with a question like this, with sort of a little lightheartedness, they they tend to be more receptive than I come in than if I come in and say I've done some research, and I think the man who came to dinner would have this, and I don't think that they would have this, and if you have this, then it's wrong. You know, I can't I don't do that. Um, but you have to be prepared for the fact that the director may say, no, sorry, I don't want anything. I want it empty. Here's the alternative. You also have to be careful about overpromising. You want to make sure that whatever you're thinking is something you can do. Don't say you're going to build the Palace of Versailles on stage if you can't build the Palace of Versailles on stage, because it's just going to come back to bite you later. Um, deep historic research. You know, it gets, it gets, this is one of the things that is the hardest thing for me to teach. Um, a, a generation of students who have come into, into this world using computers and, and four inch screens. But if you can get off of a four inch screen and actually do some research either on a laptop or um, you know, in, in old fashioned paper books, um, do that. 
And, and one of the things that I didn't put in here, but people are always, I, one of the most common questions that I get asked specifically in the period decor classes, how do you come up with search terms? And the answer is, um, I use the names of monarchs, I use the names of leaders, I use the names of regions, and then I use the name of the historic period. Because I will tell you, literally, everyone on the planet thinks that, you know, the weird old uh, elephant leg um, 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 umbrella stand is Victorian. And I'm just here to tell you that not everything can be Victorian, so quit saying that. And it's not Edwardian either. Oh, my God. Um, but that's the thing is, one of the things that frequently happens is um, we wander into these historic periods looking for things, and we use a sort of a generic name. And literally, I mean, every Tom, Dick, and Harry on Pinterest thinks they have the line on what the ultimate Victorian interior is. And no, it's not. So um, I recommend a variety of approaches. I recommend books. Um, I recommend visits to museums. Oh my goodness, visits to museums that have decorative arts sections can give you so much. Um, having conversations with other designers, the costume designer, the lighting designer, discussing practical lighting, discussing how things will happen. Going back and deep digging, deep like drilling into the text, and if you have the benefit of a dramaturg, talking to them as well. Um, going back, one of the things that I always tell my students, and it sounds so stupid because we live in a Google-centric universe, but you know the, the image search algorithm on Bing is a little bit crisper and a little bit better than the Google image algorithm. And I don't know why. Um, but if I type in um, a specific period and then say armchair on Google, I'll get every armchair in the world and then some that are in the period. And in Bing, not only do I get the image, but it also makes, it's got this great little thing where it sort of predicts and makes recommendations across the top of the page. So for instance, just as an example, when I'm doing a discussion in my introduction to design class and I start to talk about Ellsworth Kelly, the painter, and I describe hard edged color field painting and I search for Ellsworth Kelly, it gives me all of the artists that were working, Frank Stella and a bunch of other guys and women who were working at the same time as Kelly was doing similar work. And I just love that because, you know, let, let it do a little bit of the thinking for you. So what's next? How to, this is, you know, I mean, good Lord, how can I really cram this onto a slide? Um, but start gathering items early in the process and set them aside. Don't leave this until days before technical rehearsals. Here's why, as long as we're all friends and talking here on this Zoom, um, let's talk just ever so briefly about work-life balance. You're going to be exhausted the week of tech. You will have been working ridiculous hour days, procuring, making, upholstering, covering, painting, unpainting and repainting, finishing, paper propping, and doing all sorts of other stuff for this show. Do not save decorating your house for when you're exhausted. Let's face it, you move into a new house, you unpack your boxes, then you go upstairs and go to bed or you order Chinese food or you, you know, I don't know, or you drink a beer, but you don't immediately start hanging paintings and decorating the house, right? I mean, is it just me? Maybe it's just me. But we get a set onto the stage and we're all exhausted and we're done with the props. And now we go in and try and dress the set. Don't do that to yourself. If you have to, Figure out a way to do it when you're not exhausted. And one of the ways to do that is to, to roll as you do it. It's like all the, all the different cooking channels that say if you wash dishes while you're cooking, you won't have any dishes to wash at the end. And of course, that's only partially true. But if you, if you are rolling, thinking about even if it's only an hour out of your eight hour or 12 hour day, eight hour, 10 hour, 12 hour day, however long you work. Um, even if it's only an hour out of the day where you're sitting and just making lists or looking at pictures, you're thinking about it, do that. Visit thrift shops, antique malls, consignment galleries on days when you're not working. I know that sounds stupid, but it's something that I do. On a Saturday, when you have some time to wander, when you can go and get a sandwich and a cup of coffee, when you can go back in and wander around again, and when you can negotiate. 
Um, but don't rush. If you go into the antique place with a list where you say, I need a second empire Victorian sofa right now, you know, th they've got you on a hook. So have it be something that you're sort of looking for as a tertiary thing. Um, if at all possible, work a couple of shows in advance. And people always balk at me when I say that. But I mean, at any, any given time, Oklahoma City University has three shows in its shop. So I'm always trying to juggle, um, you know, an opera, a main stage, and then one other thing. Work in layers. Add stuff in, go away and come back. Don't dress the set all at once. Apply the basic stuff first, apply secondary items second, and then put heavenly details last. I don't imagine that Gene Wilson started out dressing the set for Sherlock Holmes with, you know, the letter opener stuck out of the mantle, but it showed up. Um, this is just a side note for me, and it's something that I've experienced, and maybe you're really good at it and I'm wrong, but handmade set dressing often looks handmade. Um, start with original goods if possible. I mean, if you need, you know, if you're doing crimes of the heart and you need children's artwork hanging on the refrigerator, you know, maybe handmade works there, but maybe it's also not a bad idea to actually curate that and find somebody who has a child to draw you something. I guarantee you the worst thing that I've ever seen is um, an elementary school classroom that was decorated by a bunch of adults where they didn't bother to actually get any kids artwork to put on the wall and it looked like you would expect. It didn't look right. It's not to say one handmade piece isn't a bad idea. Um, it's not to say that one of your pieces of artwork that you made isn't a bad thing to put on a set, but let's not do the whole thing that way. So this is a show called, I'm just gonna show you some pictures and sort of mumble my way through it. And, and I suffer from that syndrome where I look at things that I did before and all I see are the stuff that the things that I should have done differently. I don't actually appreciate what I did. So bear with me. But this is the, the vaudevillian and the vaudevillian is an opera. I believe it was, I don't think it was a world premiere, but it was a very early, it's a very new opera. And it's written about um, an opera singer whose name I has now been lost in my, you know, gigantic like cat playhouse of a head. But um, <laughs> um, it's, it's based on a true um, soprano at, at about the turn of the century. First name was Rosa. I'm not gonna, I may, maybe Peretti, not sure. If you know, throw it into the, throw it into the chat and gloat that I didn't remember. But anyway, um, it's about this, this, this vaudevillian actress who is courted and, and hired by the Metropolitan Opera. She's an amazing soprano. And the opening scene is her and one of her, and her and her, her assistant, her, her like makeup artist slash maid slash, you know, helper um, in the dressing room. And we had a very tiny set to put this on. This is a side stage. So it was incredibly shallow. We had the the little, the little window going out to the alley. We had the steam pipes running through it. And I started, um, believe it or not, with that dressing screen, the peacock dress screen, just because it speaks so much to the theme of the show. The idea that, that, that th this woman on, on, the, on, on the left of the screen is the opera singer and, and is such an amazing character. And so I just thought the peacock, the peacock dressing screen was fun. And then we included some objects drying over the, over the steam pipe. Um, we couldn't get a radiator onto this set. I tried to, and they, they balked because, you know, a radiator weighs like 400 pounds. Um, so we put a little tiny plant stand table there with her champagne bottle and her champagne glasses. And one of the things I had a student dressing the set. And one of the things that she did was she put multiple bouquets of flowers and what got dressed in after this photo was taken was we even had some bouquets of slightly dead or dying flowers just to show that this woman is sort of the toast of the town and receiving, you know, visitors and flowers and bottles of champagne. But the other thing that we wanted to establish in the look of this set is she's been in this dressing room for a while. So there are these photographs and clippings and postcards and other photographs of people. And this is um, ultimately where you get to, if you're going to tell a joke, where you get to tell a joke, a visual joke, because um, 
this picture, which you can't see, see and I'm not going to zoom into it, but I have, I have uncles who are identical twins and my, my grandmother loved taking pictures of them in all the various settings. And so um, I have tons of pictures of these little twin boys from the 1940s dressed in identical outfits. And so we put that onto the set. Um, so that's a place where you can sort of do that, but it's also a good place, a good time to go and look through, it's gross, but look through boxes and envelopes and things that show up at, at thrift stores and that show up at antique dealers, because frequently they will have just stuff from people's attics and you can find old photo albums and oh my gosh, old photo albums are the best because people were doing some pretty ridiculous things for their photo and putting them into photo albums. So this is one set of the vaudevillian, and this show was also a complicated show because um, it was multiple sets on a, sh on, a, on a stage that has no fly house. So everything either had to be a standing unit or it had to track on and off. So the next set is this, this Park Avenue living room, and, um, and we have um, the voice teacher who has been hired to train or teach um, Rosa, and we meet him. Um, he's sitting here listening to, um, you know, this Park Avenue debutante singing in her parents' sitting room. And of course, here's the matron, here's the mom. And so we had to go with a couple of things. And this was a particular unit where um, I noticed that they had a lot of gold trim on it. And so you'll notice that the, um, that the, Louis, the, the Louis chairs, the, 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 the Rococo chairs upstage are gilded. So they've got some beautiful gold on them. And then the frames were all had all had a little gold, and we sort of tried to curate in some little frames and kind of balance some things out. And also just making comments about the you know the quality of the home, the fact that everything is gilded and that the stuff that isn't gilded looks like real Park Avenue antiques was one of the choices that we had to make. And on this table up here, there was um, you know this is supposed to be sort of the entry parlor sitting room in um, in an apartment. And so there, there was like the little butler's tray and a few other things set on, on that. Um, but this was one of those moments where these, this unit tracked on and the stuff had to be able to sort of pal it on and pal it off relatively easily. So I tried to get as much, I'm just gonna say it, as much sort of, you know, we'll just say boom for the buck um, by, by using some really special furniture. Um, and that's one, one of the little tricks. Um, one of the things that I haven't mentioned, but um, is also a trick of the set decorator is just paying attention to details. Honestly, this is going to sound bad. When you're in other people's houses, pay attention to the details. Pay attention to how they keep things because stuff like that tells you a lot about the person. You know, I have another friend who collects pens and you walk into his study and it's just cups and mugs and, 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 you know, urns full of pens. It's ridiculous. So just pay attention to that because you may be surprised. You may see something where it's like, huh, wouldn't have thought of that, but there you go. This is one, this is one where um, I try to, uh, one of the things that I try to impress is we had this, it's, it's um, a bright room called Day, and it's this vast, um, it's supposed to be sort of a, a Berlin kind of artist's loft in the early 1930s. And so we, I, we did some research on industrial spaces and I designed this set. And we did some researches on, uh, research on industrial spaces and I tried to find sort of this kind of interesting concrete brick look um several of my friends saw it and said you know it was the friends set on stage and i it, i don't think it was so we'll just say that but this is also a challenge because this set evolves over uh like a five-year period during the course of the show and so stuff comes on stuff goes off and it slowly dwindles and they lose more and more of their belongings but two of the things that i felt fairly strongly about the director wanted to establish sort of two working acting areas and so we put carpets down to sort of establish a little kitchen area versus a little sitting area. And again, little tiny things that matter. Um, this is a Cars Kazakh rug um, and I I, it's mine. And I originally got it by borrowing it from an antique rug place and he let me use it in a show. And then I brought it back and then I borrowed it again. 
Then I brought it back and he finally said to me, why don't you just buy it from me? I'll take your rentals as part of the payment. And so I paid a very small amount of money for a very nice rug and I've used it in multiple things. So, um, but th again, this was one of these things where it was a, he's a really nice guy, really nice director, but he had the actors kind of moving all over the stage and it was really hard to get a re really good solid bead on how he wanted it dressed. And it was also this vast and massive kind of expansive space but one of the things that you'll notice is on the upper level, there's actually a bathroom. Don't ask. Um, it's a Wonderful Life, the radio show. Again, this is one of those situations where I kind of, we have a kind of a big yawning uh, modified thrust stage. And so it's really hard to fill it out with platforming. And so frequently we'll add carpeting. Um, but there's also this feature that in radio studios in the 19... 20s, 30s, and 40s, um, they um, included carpet as a sound deadening um, thing so that people could walk around and walk up to the microphone without having to take their shoes off. And that was just a little bit of sort of special sauce that I found as I was, um, as I was researching period radio stations. But the other thing that was interesting is just the idea that, you know, originally when we designed this set originally, um, or designed the, the look originally, um, we had all matching chairs and all matching pictures and everything was very matchy matchy. And then I started looking around and I visited, I actually visited a TV station in town and I realized they don't have matching any, like it's just this weird amalgam of crap at any given time. And so I decided for a large cast radio show, maybe they wouldn't have all matching chairs and they'd have sets of chairs that came from different parts of the studio. They'd have different glass pitchers to hold the water because this is a pretty big radio play that's going on. Um, there's also the challenge in this show that they wanted presents and they wanted presents scattered around the front of the stage, which, you know, I mean, we get it. It's a Christmas show, but do we, do we really need to like, I mean, do we have to have Santa walk through the audience to tell the audience that, um, but this was, this was fun. And it was also entertaining because we needed a, we needed a live playable piano. So there's your gigantic studio rolling piano. And there was an organ as well as the, um, the, the, um, Foley artist over here, the sound effects guy, um, and all that stuff actually functioned on stage. So it's an interesting mixture of dressing and non-dressing items. The Man Who Came to Dinner, um, this was designed by a visiting artist and it was a bit of a challenge. And it's also a challenge because we had an antique wheelchair and an actor who had a really hard time navigating in, in, in an antique wheelchair. But this is also an example of just finding things that we can sort of put onto the set that kind of make sense, but also don't take over the room. Um, so the, the chairs, um, the chaise, which my students will tell you, I actually hate putting chaises on stage because I just think they're kind of contrived, not really sure. Um, but um, uh, if you'll notice upstage, there is a little bar cart that actually has the sort of very specific 1940s era cocktail stand that would have been set up in any kind of modern American living room. Um, the piano um, um, stage left, um, the director wanted one that there's actually a moment where somebody walks along and sort of ding, 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 ding down the piano. And so they wanted it playable. And again, with the rugs, just sort of trying to entertain, but also take up space and also treat it like, you know, the, the reality of it is before there was wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in these rooms, they didn't have completely bare floors. They had carpeting. And so that's an important feature. I just want to make a note about this and say um, I did not um, pick the color of the walls and that the portrait was done uh, by a student and you know, who was sort of learning how to do things. And, you know, as a teaching institution, there are times where we have to put things on stage. So this was my one exception to the no handmade objects rule. Here's a different look, same set. Oh, and it's, and the, and the portrait's been replaced by a portrait of the actor. So, now would be a good time, I'll put that up, but I'm gonna actually stop sharing my screen and just ask people, hey, Mary. 
just ask people if they have, if there are questions, comments, complaints, anything that anybody would like to share or ask. Well, Larry, I'll say that I was taking notes <laughs> of stuff that you said that I know, but like is really great to share with my It's, students, you know, it's, so. it's so great because I, I'll, I'll just do a shout out. I, I watched Jessica Rosenlieb's um, um, upholstery thing and I used it in a class and it's just so nice to have things like somebody else speak something into existence so that you don't have to think that you're the only one who thinks this. Or the thing that I took away from that, and I actually sent her an email after it was, she said um, that she's never, never touched springs on a sofa or on a piece of upholstery, that if it needs to be, that we're doing theater and if it needs a seat, she puts a wooden seat in on it. And I thought <laughs> I was the only person who, um, who, who, who thought that. <laughs> I have I have not worked with Leslie Rollins, Zoe. I have worked with people who have worked with him, and there's sort of a sort of a degrees of separation. But that's, um, that's so funny that she asked that because I was going to ask you that in private because I worked with Leslie and I thought maybe you knew him because I've worked with him too. <laughs> I, it's it's degrees of separation, and I think he did Miss Congeniality, but I'm not 100 percent sure. I don't remember. But I was brought in as a I was brought in as a pro from Dover to to stitch drapery on, on, on that show. And it was only there for about six days. So anyway, well, I can, um, uh, I can go to the chat and there was a, we did have a few questions. Um, we had one that I thought was really interesting, uh, from Jason. Uh, he asked, how do you dress shows for specific groups of people or cultures and keep it authentic without, but, you know, playing into a stereotype, um or a caricature of, of that group or culture that's a great question yeah. um so uh, i'll say specifically I, I and this is not me name dropping but i will say specifically um when we did uh we did um um a raisin in the sun at uh the huntington theater and um and um it was uh, the the actress who was playing Lena in the in the play was Esther Roll, who people may know from the television show Good Times, and um, it was interesting because I wanted to put photographs of people, specifically her husband, on the set um, because she he's referred to in the in the text at one point, and I I I went to the actress and I actually sat I I mean I made an appointment and I had a sit down with her and I said, can we talk a little bit about set dressing and stuff that we're going to put on the set and give you give me some thumbs ups and some, some thumbs down. And it was really funny because she said, well, I'll tell you a story. And she said, uh, I did this show at a different theater and um, the, the props team came in and they were dressing the set and they put this photograph of this really handsome and well-dressed man on, um, on, on the, thing and I said and who's this and she said well that's your husband and she smiled she said I smiled at them and said well I was never married to the publisher of Jet Magazine and it was one of those moments where <laughs> she was of the right age that she would recognize the man and that that it was just it was one of those cultural moments so I I learned fairly early on from a pretty good set dresser to not ever make any assumptions about what you can and can't put on the set and so frequently I will interview I'll quiz the actors just go in during a during during a rehearsal or a break or something and pull them aside and say so this 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 and like specifically with Ruth I asked is there anything that you want to see on the set that's really important to you. And she said, my grandmother always had a box of raisins and a jar of um, a jar of butterscotch candies on her counter. And I said, is that something that's important? And she said, it, you know, you know. And so I, that's so easy. It's like, okay, so I've got the standard flour, sugar, coffee, tea canisters, and I've got all the other stuff, but can I put some things on there that actually speak to the to the heart of the actors? So um, in general, yeah, I mean, it's a great question, but I start out by asking people and, and just sort of when I don't know, I ask and I ask permission. Um, and, and it's a good way to get, I mean, it's a good way to get some authentic narrative, but it's also a good way to make sure that I'm not putting the publisher of Jet Magazine on the set as somebody's husband. So good question though. Right. Uh, yeah, and I would say I, um... Uh, I had, we did a production of, um, 
it was the seagull or it was one of the checkoff plays. <laughs> I can't remember which one, but students were dressing the set and then they put, um, they had found a pic, I said, find some pictures to dress the set, like some photographs. And somebody found a picture of like the bizarre Nicholas or something. I was like, we can't put that on this set. Right. Like, that's a very well-known photograph. So I think it was just like, do your research, dive right. a little, like you said, do di dive a little deeper. Don't just take the first, you know, image that pops up if you're going to do something like that. So, so I credit Alice McGuire, who, again, I've mentioned before, and I, I constantly throw her name out, but I credit Alice McGuire with this. Um, Alice, is, Alice was raised, um, she went to parochial school, she's Catholic, and for whatever reason, um, it just, we had some conversations and some things stuck, and it was very funny, because about probably 10 years after I worked for Alice, I was dressing a set for a movie, and um, the somebody came, it was supposed to be at the Catholic church and um, somebody came in and, uh, and they had the wrong Pope for the era. And I said, I pointed and I said, uh, that's the wrong Pope. And I, I don't honestly, I'm, I can't remember who it was, but it was in the thirties. And it was interesting because there was this interesting period of time where the, the pattern went fat Pope, skinny Pope, fat coat, Pope, skinny Pope. <laughs> and, and, and so they had put up the skinny Pope and I was like, that's the wrong Pope. And it was really funny because the set decorator looked at me and she was like, how do you know this? And I said, I just do. And she said, well, who's the right Pope? And I said, you know, whatever it was, pious, or I don't remember what it was. And I said, I'll go find him. And I went and found him and put, put the right one up. But every once in a while, you need to be, you need to be really careful about that because there is going to be one person in the audience who recognizes somebody. So yeah. yeah. What else? Um, the next one was um, actually from Jay and he asked like, when do you stop? When do you stop with the minutia, especially oh, I about something upstate? Like, do you have a stopping point of saying it's enough? I, I, I stop when um, I, I've put someplace everywhere. I mean, I don't, I don't, it, it, it's like, I'm not, you know, I, I'll just, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not obsessive. I mean, I, I, I sound obsessive because it's what I do, but, um, but there's a point where we'll put things, we'll, we'll put, you know, five or six objects on a table and then we'll be done. Um, the other way to stop, the other way I stop is um, a trick that I learned from somebody where you go down to the front of the stage and um, you face the audience and with lights on and you turn around. And if your eye isn't drawn to any one part of the set, you're done. Oh, that's a great one. Um, and that, and that decorator was actually, he was a, he was a, he had come to this from um, um, actually being a home decor specialist. And one of the things that he always said was uh, a spot of lipstick red and a spot of apple green, and then you're done. And so that's one of the other things that I will do is I will put something red to something green onto the set, and then I'll and then I'll be done. Yeah, great. That's great advice. I love the turning around quick and just it's, kind of seeing what you notice. Yeah, if you notice anything, and that's the other thing is if your eye is drawn somewhere, throw that away. Mm. Like like pull that off and throw it away because it's obviously doing something that it shouldn't. Right. Um, the next one is another one from Jason and he asked, um, what dressing items do you find the most versatile to and worth having in your stock? Like uh, if you're going to like purchase some things to put in your stock, what are the things that are the most useful and versatile? Picture frames. Anytime you go into an antique gallery or someplace that has stacks of picture frames in varying sizes that are not very expensive, buy them. I Great. strongly recommend that, that. And I'll throw in another plug here because I know that everybody goes, ew, pictures, because nobody likes framing pictures. And so I'll throw in a plug. I don't have it with me because it's actually at work. But if you go to a place that sells framing supplies and you buy, it's called um, it's called the Glazer's Point Gun. And it's literally a staple gun that shoots Glazer's Points. You can put anything into any picture frame and then go pop, 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 pop around the corner. Around, around the perimeter and it's in and you don't have, and that's what professional framers use. And I was 56 years old when I, when I bought my first one and I'm so stunned that I haven't had one in the past, but it makes things so much, it makes framing pictures so much easier. So I would say picture frames, I would say some lamps and lamp shades. And the other thing that I would say is find a good way to store your lampshades. I store my lampshades when I can in clear plastic garbage bags so that they don't get dusty, they don't get dirty, but you can always see what they are. 
Oh, that's great advice. I that I feel like storing lampshades is like a conundrum of anybody that has to manage prop stock because they take up so much room. Yeah, clear plastic garbage bags. And if you have a ceiling that you can hoist them from, hoist them in bags from the ceiling. Oh, that's a great idea. Um, let's see, what else? Um, Uh, Patrick was asking, when you're addressing a set, uh, do you talk to the set designer about every detail or how much freedom as a prop master or set decorator do you have? Um, so that depends on the designer. Some designers like to hang out and fiddle around and do things, but almost all designers, if I come in and I have a sort of what I'll call, call a robust ownership of what I'm doing, most designers will say, you do your thing and then I'll come in and, and move things around if I want to move things around. Um, occasionally, I will make a designer sit in the house with me when, when I'm doing things like hanging, like on that, on that I know it sounds stupid, but on that, um, um, you can't take it with you set. The set designer was Yoon Bay. I don't know if anybody knows Yoon, but she's this wonderful um designer and and um i i mean i just love her and she really wanted to stand on the stage and like level uh, watch me and tell me what to do with all the, the photographs and i will i'm totally happy to do that um if the designer comes to me and says that they want something specific um you know i'd like I mean, I, I go to a Raisin in the Sun because I've actually done, I've worked on four productions of it. And one of the designers thought it would be interesting if um, Ruth had a collection of salt shakers, just an odd little thing that you might collect and sort of keep on the windowsill. And um, the designer came to me and said that they wanted to do that and that they wanted to go with me and find them. And so we did. Um, so I guess it varies from designer to designer, but most of the time, they're willing to, they're perfectly happy to sit back and let me fiddle around with stuff and then come in and look at it. Great. I've had the same experience. It depends on the designer. It really does. And it, and it was also funny. So going back to the question about cultural stuff, this is actually really, um, this is an embarrassing story for me, but um, he was such, he was so incredibly sweet about it. We did um, a show called The Woman Warrior by Maxine Hong Kingston. At the, at the Huntington and the director was Sharon Ah and the designer was Ming. And, and I did, and, and the story is um, that the, the main character's family emigrated to the United States and opened a laundry in San Francisco. And it's sort of the classic Chinese laundry story. And so I went to a place in Boston that actually sold supplies for companies that are for like commercial laundries and bought rolls of paper and boxes and got a couple of, found an out of date calendar that they had in their office and asked them if I could take it. And, you know, and so I dressed out the set and um, I put everything onto the set, including, um, a sh I did two things. I, people of a certain age will remember a shaker bottle where you fill a, bo a soda bottle with water and put a top in it and shake it out and shake water onto clothing and then fold the clothing up because, and this was from before irons produced their own steam. So that was a feature of my mom's kitchen that I included. But I also included, um, I saw it on the shelf in one of the places that I went in the Asian district in Boston. So I put a beckoning cat statue up on the, the, shelf next to the shaker bottle. And it was really sweet because Ming came in and he pointed to the shaker bottle and he went, my mom had one of those. And I said, mine too. And then he, and then he pointed to the beckoning cat and he went, that's Japanese, not Chinese. And I was like, yikes. Okay. I guess I should have known that. And he was like, you had no way of knowing, just take it down. And they took it down and he was very gracious about it. You know, he didn't break it over my head or anything. So I think I got away good, but you do have to be careful and you do have to be mindful of that. Yeah. Well, at least that was, was my that was my learning moment yeah. when that happened. I, I had a little cringe and then I realized I can't just do that. So, right. At least he was great, very gracious about it. He was. <laughs> he was. Uh, the, 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 the bottle with the um, the Coke bottle top thing, like I've asked my mom about that. Uh, I, I don't know. I can't remember what the context was, but I couldn't remember what it looked like or something. And my mother, my mother, who's not artistic, drew a picture of a Coke bottle with the little thing with the direction. I kept that picture somewhere. But anyway, yeah, um, I'm just, and it, you know, it's I, such I found... a great detail for ironing 
Um, I was. It was not only. It was not. I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt, Larry. But it was. It's such a great detail because it was something I shared with the actors and said, "If we were ironing, you would have done this." And yeah. they love that. Like yeah. they loved that I shared that with them. It's one of those hilarious details, and it's really funny because there was this probably now out of business, privately owned hardware store in Cambridge, Massachusetts that had them hanging on the wall. And I just went in and bought one. And I was like, I can't believe you guys still sell this. And the guy shrugged and said, we still have people in the neighborhood who iron that way. And I was just blown away by it. Yeah. So this is going back a few years though. No, what you else? Can them, you can buy them on eBay or Etsy. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Patrick asked, do you ever put things that are out of sight from the audience? but are really for the actors. I think you kind of already touched on that maybe a little bit. Sometimes, I mean, it depends. Sometimes I do, yeah, sometimes. And sometimes I just, you know, little bits of reality, like um, on the on the desk, you didn't see it, but on the desk um, for, uh, um, you can't, er, uh, the man who came to dinner. Um, I think the main character, I think Whiteside's host in the in the show, and it's been a few years, but I believe the host is supposed to be the editor of the newspaper. And so I found this great little box that uh, had ridges cut into the top of it. And when I first saw it, I thought it was a cigar box of some sort. And then the antique owner said, no, it's a, it's a pen box. And you put the pen, you keep your your out of service pens inside the box and the pens that you're using, the fountains pens that you're using, you keep on top of the box filled. And I was just blown away by this little thing. And so we bought the box and then put fountain pens, like a collection of fountain pens onto the, onto the set. So that again, I'm working in a theater that is modified thrust so that the front row of the audience is probably 12 feet away. So mm -hmm. it's a pretty, like if we push stuff down onto that apron, it's, the audience is pretty close. Like if I put a, a package of Tic Tacs in there, they're going to know. So I have to be really careful. Right, right. Um, Jay, I know you've popped on. We had one one more question, then I'll throw it over to you. Um, just to not leave anybody out here that was asking. Um, last question from Kylie. Uh, they ask, do you ever group your potential dressing by color or texture in order to paint the right color or textures onto the set? So do you use... The set dressing. I mean, you mentioned the yellow or the red and the green uh, thing a second ago, but they're yeah. asking, do you use it to kind of like, uh, I, I guess, make a composition to like paint, to add color? I, I can, but I don't, I, but, but I, again, you have to be kind of careful because you don't want to be too matchy matchy. I did a set where um, I put a bed on the stage and it was supposed to, and I, and I went in and dressed out the bed and put, you know, layers of pillows and fabulous stuff on the bed and the actor came in and looked at it and said I love this but it looks like it's the Bed Bath and Beyond catalog so you kind of have to be careful because you you're you're dancing this weird line of curating things that you're putting on stage and reality so in some situations I haven't had to do that much but I I know that there are times where I'll pull things and I'll say you know we've got reds we've got golds we've got this we've got that and then the other thing that that sort of is a is a corollary of that is um, frequently I'm working with period colors. You know, you're working with the 1950s where there was a very specific teal or a very specific green that showed up in decor. And so I try and honor that as well. It's a good way of doing it. I don't do it that much because it's, I mean, she's being very generous, but there are times where I just don't have that much to select from and I'm just bringing things in and putting as much stuff as I can on, right. but it's not a bad way to approach it. Sure. All right. I think that wraps it up for the Q and A. Um, so thank you very much, Larry. I learned a ton. I, I want to, next time I think about something set dressing, I'll reach out to you and we can chat. Um, yeah, I love that. I mean, you know, and um, I mean, we can put my email into the chat if people have questions that they want to send me after this about, you know, how would you, if you want to do that, I'm, totally, I'm, I, I am good about, I don't have, I'm not one of those people that has a bunch of unanswered email in my inbox. I answer my emails because I don't like seeing the little red number. So, right. um, <laughs> well, that's good to know. And uh, we could definitely do that while Jay's uh, doing his uh, spiel here at the end. Um, so I'm going to introduce Jay Lasnik. Uh, he's the prop supervisor at Penn State University, and he's going to give us a look back at the past year plus of Spaminars, and then give us a peek of what's coming up in 2022. 
can't believe it's going to be 22 very soon. So take it away, right. Jay. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, Larry, uh, the most important thing I learned is don't overpromise. <laughs> so it's oh my gosh. my post-it note. I'll take it to work tomorrow. Uh, yeah, un under promise, over deliver and make everybody think you're a genius. I mean, I'm and, serious uh, about that. Oh, it's, for sure. It's very serious, yeah. And uh, Thanks before, for everything. Oh, you bet, of course, thank you. Um, uh, I just wanted to relate to two little set dressing um, experiences before I get on with, uh, with the coming attractions of next year. But when I worked for the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco, we did a show called 4,000 Miles. I'm sure some of you have, have done it. And I remember uh, when you mentioned the word butterscotch, uh, butterscotch candies, it made me think about when I was dressing the set with Ryan Parham, the, the supervisor at the time, I was the assistant, of how many little stations we had around the apartment. This is a Brooklyn apartment, with a, a grandmother that's lived there for 45 or 50 years. And her grandson has uh, bicycled from Seattle 4,000 miles to visit her in, in Brooklyn. And so everywhere she had little stations and there was always a, a Kleenex box and a dental floss thing and a, a pad of paper and a, you know, or a crossword puzzle. Because as we know, in your own houses or apartments or workplaces, we all have stations of what we do and they're subconscious, but they support, they support us. And um, the other great story is that we actually had what I call the pillow audition day, where the director and the actors sat on, the, the actors sat on the couch, the director and, and the prop managers, uh, Ryan and I were, you know, on the, on the apron, and we'd give them certain pillows, because this pillow is only good for your right arm when you're watching TV. And this pillow is only good for your back, you know, your back when you're doing crossword puzzles, and you arrange these things in your life, you don't really know that you're doing them, but you, you do them. And then when they're not there, your whole world falls apart. So um, anyway, thank you, Larry. Thank you, Mary. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm gonna share with you a little bit of what we've done in the past, the past uh, 15 months, and then uh, share with you what our plans are for the future. All right, here we go. Um, in, let me give you a little bit of history. Uh, last year, when the Society of Props, Artists, and Managers was forced to have our first of two 100% remote or virtual conferences. Uh, we had our conference and, and several of us were discussing, well, what can we do to expand our reach? We have such a plethora of, of professional knowledge of really passionate people. How can we get, how can we share our knowledge and share our enthusiasm and our professionalism with more people in, in the prop world, in the prop community. Someone suggested we should do some webinars and another person said, let's call them spaminars. And I think I said, I'll, I'll lead it for a while. So I asked for volunteers. And so many people raised their hand and said, I'll do communications, I'll be the TD, I'll, um, I'll do this, I'll do that. So, um, as you can see on the screen, in, uh, from September 2020 to November to today, we've had 15 spaminars. We didn't stop one month. We've had 14 unique subjects, 12 unique presenters, and 11 moderators. And in a second, I'm going to share with you who the presenters were. But I want to acknowledge who our moderators were and some of our advisors and um, people that supported us over the last year and a half. Uh, those people were Jim Guy, the props director from Milwaukee Rep, Stephanie Hansen, from, uh, the associate professor from the University of Delaware, Jen McClure, the prop supervisor at Yale Rep, Karen Rab Vance, owner of SD Arts and a freelancer in the Los Angeles area right now, Aaron Keller, the props manager at Hartford Stage, Monique Walker from Infinite Scenic, 
Anna Catton, the founder of Reset, Cass Westover from Homegrown Wrappings in Chicago, Ben Holman, the props director from Utah Shakespeare Festival, Jessica Rosenlieb, the prop supervisor from Cleveland Playhouse, and Mary Houston, you met her tonight from University of Northern Colorado. Sometimes uh, people think, oh, it's just two or three people that do that and how easy it is. And I've learned that doing something that looks as simple as a Spaminar takes a lot of people. And I'm personally very thankful uh, for everyone that, uh, that joined me on this fantastic journey. Um, we have uh, over 600 people that have attended these Spaminars. And last I checked over 2,500 YouTube views. Um, and something that I'm especially very thankful for is because of your generosity in donating three, five, ten dollars. I know a lot of people don't have jobs. They certainly didn't last year. People still donate it. It's wonderful because we've raised over two thousand dollars for our grants that the society gives to early career prop professionals. So you are helping to make a difference in young professionals' lives. And I know when I was 19, I was an intern, I would have loved to get a grant. So thank you, thank you very much. Last year, our first Spaminar ever in the whole world was Nikki Kulas, who did a Spaminar on puppets titled Life is Hard, Puppets, Pups, Puppets Aren't, sorry, Tips and Tricks for Puppet Building. Our second was Jen, bloody hell, a variety of ways to execute blood special effects. Ben from uh, Utah, Texture 101, uh, different tips and, and tricks of, of how to enhance your prop, how to make it uh, more three-dimensional as a character, how to make it really live and come through and cross that fourth wall into the audience. Jen came back for a mold making Spaminar, different kinds of molds, when to use this kind, when to use that kind. Larry, our guest presenter tonight, his first Spaminar was props adjacent careers in film, and TV trades. Next, we did our first Ask a Prop Manager Anything. This was a fantastic event because we had one props manager from different kinds of theater. Lori Harrison from the San Francisco Opera. Ben from Utah Shakespeare Festival. Shakespeare Festival, they have three theaters. They work in rep. Nikki Kulas, Puppets, Children's Theater, and Jen from Education, from Yale Rep. So the four of them were asked questions, a multitude of questions from all different kinds of people around the country about their experiences uh, as managing in these different kinds of venues. It was fantastic. After that, Mara Rich from Syracuse Stage did a Spaminar on um, spreadsheet methods and how to simplify paperwork, but also how to support yourself as a manager by using some uh, simple equations and ways to reorganize and work with your paperwork. Next was Eric Hart. Uh, Eric Hart did a Spaminar on um, things that you can do at home. And uh, this was also in conjunction with a book giveaway that we did, one of uh, three that we've done so far. So that was really exciting. And after Eric was Emer Murphy from the Abbey Theater in Ireland, our first international Spaminar. Uh, Emer is the only props manager in Ireland. And as you know, the Abbey Theater is extremely historical and important in English speaking theater. It was fantastic. Tom, Tom Fiocchi from Ohio University uh, did a Spaminar on how to build safe combat weapons. It was really fun. Hope you check it out. Natalie Kearns, our second international Spaminar from uh, Ontario uh, talked about how to make your 
paper props more alive and more authentic. After Natalie, Jessica from Cleveland. Tufting, tacking, and trimming. Uh, tips and trick for theatrical upholstery. After Jessica, Kirsten, the author of the Fake Food Cookbook. Um, our second book giveaway. And it was really fun. All different kinds of ways to make fake food. Jen made another appearance, her second blood spaminar. Uh, this one was more about why you'd want to make your own blood uh, instead of purchasing it from a different company and different ingredients and in how to create realistic looking blood. And tonight comes a, uh, brings us to uh, Larry uh, and the forgotten narrative of set decoration. All right. So what's coming up for 2022? In January, the Education Committee of the Society is going to uh, do a spaminar on student resumes and portfolio reviews. And that's gonna piggyback off of an event that's in December. So be sure to keep checking out our uh, Facebook page, Props for the Stage and Beyond. In February, I'll be doing an event on um, cool builds that we've done here in the prop shop. And if you've followed me on Instagram or on that uh, Facebook page I just mentioned, you'll see from time to time I put up cool things. Uh, big puppets, interesting boxes, uh, a lot of large things, uh, frog and toad, magic mushrooms, magic boxes, uh, eight foot bulls, six foot eyeballs, all kinds of things like that. And then next year, some events that we haven't scheduled yet, but they're in the uh, development stage, a spaminar on eco-consciousness and green theater, and how as props managers and artisans, we fit into that. Uh, one on unusual painting techniques for props. We're gonna have a second puppet spaminar, a second upholstery spaminar, and one on firearm safety. We're gonna do a little more, uh, a little, one more spaminar on budgeting, building, time estimates, load in, load outs, and more scheduling. So not artisan skills, more management skills on that one. Uh, we're gonna do one on how to clean, how to safely clean props from water and fire damage. And then uh, one that is really interesting, we're gonna have a spaminar where a couple of different prop managers are going to talk about how they managed the same show. Uh, just for example, the best example I can think of right now, Patrick Doan, drone from Michigan, and I from Penn State, we just did a wild party. So I don't know if it'll be us, but there'll be two or three or four prop managers who've done the same show recently to talk about their props list, their priorities, how they built this, how they, they built that, and their budgeting and, and whatnot. All right, everybody. Well, since I told you what's coming up for January and February, you could get your Sharpies out and write them down in your schedule right now. All right, in closing, some of you are probably wondering, how do I become a member of SPAM? Well, if you're a working props manager, supervisor, master, or some similar title in a nonprofit theater or opera company, or an educator who teaches prop classes and prepares students for a career in props and are interested in joining SPAM, just send our membership com committee an email for more information. And their email address is membership at propmanagers.org. And you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, links are in the chat. Spaminar is produced by the Society of Props, Artists, and Managers. And special thanks to Patrick Drone from University of Michigan, Ben Holman from the Utah Shakespeare Festival, Stacy Horn Harper from Salem State University, Nikki Kulas from First Stage in Milwaukee, Amy Peter, the prop man master at DePaul University in Chicago, and Karen Rab Vance, a freelance prop manager and artist in, in Los Angeles. In closing, I wanna say personally, thank you everybody who's watched these last 15 months. 
please come back in January. In a couple of weeks is Thanksgiving. There's so much to be thankful for. Um, please continue to wear your masks, wash your hands, and prop on. Thank you. Good night.